What's up, future respiratory therapists? Hey, we're gonna stay on the pharmacology train here for just another week, if you will. Um, and we're gonna talk about SAMAs, S-A-M-A. -A. What does that stand for? What does it mean? Why should you know it as a respiratory therapist? Let's dive in. All right, so as I stated, we're talking all about SAMAs in this video. Before we jump into that, head over to respiratorycoach.com. Check out the TMC and the CSC boot camp to assist and aid you in passing your credentialing exams on the first attempt. I promise you won't regret it. Go check that out. I would appreciate it. Uh, to understand what the term SAMA means, okay, we have first have to understand and talk about the parasympathetic nervous system because it's all built in. If you saw a previous video where we talked about sabas, then you kind of know where this is going. We're going to do the same thing in this video, but this time we're talking about a different nervous system, specifically the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, what are the effects of the parasympathetic nervous system? Well, we know that the parasympathetic nervous system is the rest and digest system. It, it, it pretty much manages our, 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 our daily activities outside of fight or flight. And uh, what we know is that when overstimulated, uh, this system will cause bronchoconstriction. It will also cause a decrease in your heart rate and increase in uh, mucus and secretions. And as respiratory therapists, we don't like any of these, do we? Uh, we don't like our patients to be bronchoconstricted. We don't like a dangerously low heart rate. And we don't like excessive secretions. And so we're going to see here where the drugs we give, they aren't going to create that effect. Hopefully, we will soon see where these effects are blocked by the drugs that we give, specifically the bronchoconstriction and potentially the airway secretion. So let's jump into this. We're gonna do the same thing we did in the prior video when we were talking about the sympathetic nervous system, except now we're just talking again about the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, let me get my marker up here. Hopefully you got your, your, your paper and you're gonna draw this table with me. Uh, we're gonna start off by what is the system? Well, we've already identified that. We know that the system is the para sympathetic nervous system and that's and that's good to know now remember the effects we talked about on the previous slide we didn't like those we we want to block those effects and so when we give a drug that blocks activity on the parasympathetic nervous system we give what we call A parasympatholytic. You see, the L-Y-T-I-C on the end of there, lytic, means to block. Now, that's very different than what we previously discussed when we were talking about sympathomimetics. Remember, sympathomimetics mimicked the sympathetic nervous system because the sympathetic nervous system caused or created or stimulated bronchodilation. But you see, now we are talking about a nervous system that causes, stimulates, creates bronchoconstriction. So it makes sense that we want to block that. So we wouldn't give a parasympathomimetic that would create the same activity. So we give a parasympatholytic. We're here to block the effects of the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, again, there's a neurotransmitter in this system, and that neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. And again, we're talking about at the effector site. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter. Now, just think about that, because the drug that we use as a name is going to have acetylcholine somewhere within the name and that's why we call these drugs anti cholinergics so you see if you take the anti off you just have cholinergic acetylcholinergic that makes sense but you see we don't give cholinergic drugs 
to cause bronchodilation because if you gave a cholinergic, it would actually cause bronchoconstriction. Like if you were doing a methacholine challenge as part of a pulmonary function test for assessment of airway reactivity, methacholine is a cholinergic. It's going to cause bronchoconstriction. So what we want to give is an anti, this word part right here, anticholinergic. The anti means to block the effects of acetylcholine. So we're in the parasympathetic nervous system. We're going to block the effects of it by giving a drug that looks like acetylcholine but does not create the same effect as acetylcholine. Instead, it blocks the receptor from responding to acetylcholine. Now, you may say to yourself, okay, well, what's that receptor called? Well, that brings us to our next and last uh, row here. When we talk about the receptors in the parasympathetic nervous system, we're not talking about beta-2s. Remember, beta-2 was in the sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight. Adrenaline, beta 2, equals bronchodilation. See, now we're talking the parasympathetic nervous system. We're talking about the muscarinic receptors. There's also nicotinic receptors. But muscarinic receptors is the one that you're going to want to recognize. The M1, M2, M3. Egan's talks about it right here. All anticholinergic agents have an affinity for muscarinic M1, M2, and M3 receptors. You see, these receptors right here are the receptors that acetylcholine is looking for to cause that bronchoconstriction. Well, we don't want that to happen. So we give a SAMA, S-A-M-A. -A. What the heck does that stand for? Short-acting muscarinic antagonist. Now remember, beta-2 agonist meant good. We're going to do the same thing on the beta-2. But when we give a muscarinic antagonist, antagonist means, nope, we're going to park on that receptor, but we're not going to create the same effect that that receptor creates, which we know to be bronchoconstriction, increased mucus secretions, increased, increased secretions. And so we block that. So when you tie this all together, you realize that the parasympathetic nervous system creates bronchoconstriction, decreased heart rate, which is why we may would give atropine for symptomatic bradycardia. Why? Well, you've got bradycardia, and we want to block that effect, so we would give atropine, an anticholinergic. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter. The receptor that it's looking for is the muscarinic receptors. When all of this happens the way it's supposed to, but maybe in an excessive amount, then what happens is bronchoconstriction. We want to block that. That's why we give a parasympatholytic to block, an anticholinergic to block, muscarinic antagonist to block. So my point here is, is when you're talking about drugs such as ipratropium bromide, which is indeed a short acting muscarinic antagonist, you're giving that drug to block the, the effects of the parasympathetic nervous system that is causing the bronchoconstriction. Egan talks about this vaguely mediated, uh, uh, this vaguely mediated, uh, changes that happen within uh, the airways being bronchoconstriction, right? And, and these drugs block those effects. Now, ipratropium bromide is the only short acting. There are also LAMAs, L-A-M-A, -A, just like there was SABAs and LABAs. There's also SAMA and LAMAs. Now, L-A-M-A -A stands for long acting, muscarinic antagonist. The popular one here is teotropium bromide. There's other ones listed here. You've got a uh, glycopyrrolate, a clutinium uh, bromide, and, and such forth. Uh, but those have a much longer lasting effect. Now the question is, is when would you give these drugs to a patient? And they are categorized as bronchodilators, but they bronchodilate in a different mechanism by not causing bronchodilation 
but more blocking the bronchoconstriction effects from within the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, here's your indications for anticholinergic agents, your inhaled parasympatholytics, your muscarinic antagonists. It's pretty simple. Maintenance treatment in COPD. This includes chronic bronchitis and emphysema. And also an add-on treatment for asthma, straight out of Egan's page 728, 13th edition. Add-on treatment for asthma when first-line agents have been less effective. So if you're, if you're giving ipratropium bromide to a patient who is not diagnosed with uh, COPD and who is not diagnosed with uh, asthma, that is not responding to the first line treatment plan for asthma, then as the registered respiratory therapist, you owe it to your patient to ask, why are we delivering this medication? We know that we give SAMAs a lot of times in conjunction with SABAs. We give albuterol in conjunction with ipratropium bromide. Together they make duoneb, synergy, two drugs working together to create the same response, all of it for bronchodilation. But we realize that that um, the uh, SAMA, the ipratropium bromide, is an add-on treatment for that patient. So there you go. Now you know the difference between uh, ipratropium bromide and albuterol. Ipratropium bromide is not a SABA, but rather is a SAMA that blocks bronchoconstriction, and we like that. So um, with that, um, I appreciate you watching. I'm Respiratory Coach. Stay right here with me on YouTube. Uh, please do me a favor. Hit the subscribe button so you can join our community, get notified uh, when I uh, post routine weekly videos. Also, come follow me on Instagram at Respiratory Coach, TikTok at Respiratory Coach, and LinkedIn at Joe Lewis. And then don't forget about Respiratory Coach Academy located at respiratorycoach.com. All the resources you're looking for to pass your MBRC exams on the first attempt. Remember, at the end of the day, average is easy. Don't be it.